Good morning. Let's join up. Let's join in prayer. Heavenly Father, we rejoice on this beautiful day, especially because there's not snow on the ground this morning. We don't mind snow, just not in April. We rejoice in your presence. We rejoice in this gathering. We rejoice in this place, these students, for this purpose in these days. How exciting. Things you're doing in our lives as we bring closure to this semester and anticipate the summer and the days ahead. We worship you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, real quick, there's uh, if you're still interested in SLR, there, today's the last day to sign up. You'll do that in the student development office. And Matt Voiles has a special announcement. Good morning. This year, I have the opportunity to present the Teaching Excellence Award. So I'm going to read through the script that they gave me. <laughs> OK. The Teaching Excellence Award is granted each year by the senior class to one member of our Spring Arbor University faculty. That faculty member inspires all of us to live the concept in every area of our lives. They do this by modeling what it, means to what it means to be fully committed to Jesus Christ as our example for learning and living. This faculty member excels in teaching and in scholarship. They inspire the students to be excellent in their studies and to carry that excellence into the workplace. They use their life as a living, breathing example of what is excellent about living and learning in the Christian community. This year's honoree deserves the title of an excellent teacher. This year's Teaching Excellence winner exemplifies the Spring Arbor University concept through his teaching, ministry, and personal life. He is devoted to making his courses both theoretically challenging and eminently practical. He spends hours upon hours with students outside of class, helping with them with their academic plans, deals with their crises in life, or just chat, chats with them about what's on the student's mind. He is a professor who really cares about students and is highly sought after. His office has a steady stream of students flowing in and out of it. This is because of this year's teaching excellent. This is because this year's teaching excellence winner lives out his Christian faith in practical and tangible ways. His personal faith and trust in Jesus Christ are contagious. He is devoted to Christian ministry and in the training of the next generations of persons called into full-time Christian ministry. He cares deeply about the church and the Christian witness to the surrounding culture, and he is committed to training this generation of students to be effective witnesses for the gospel. Our Teaching Excellence winner is completely devoted to his wife and four children. He exemplifies what he teaches in classes in his home and parenting. There's no gap between his public life and his private life. In his private life, he is com deeply committed to keeping himself fit by eating well, and you can, can be regularly seen running or biking on the roads of Spring Arbor with students and colleagues alike. Now that the weather is warmer, he can be seen riding to SAU with his black leather jacket on the back of a motorcycle. Please join me in congratulating our assistant professor of youth ministry, Brian Kono, <laughs> as Spring Arbor University's 2013 Teaching Excellence Award. Will you stand and worship with us?
Yeah. 
Father, we rest in knowing your promise of eternal life with you in heaven. Father, where there will be no weeping, where there will be no pain, no tears, no crying. Father, just joy. Joy and love and peace. Father, we want so desperately to just rest with you and rest in you. And Father, you offer that to us freely. So Father, when we run to you, we run to you knowing that you have your arms wide open for us. And that you will embrace us and take us in no matter where we've been, no matter what we've done. And we thank you for that. Father, we love you. And we want nothing more than to be with you. It's an honor for me to welcome Mandy Montgomery back to our chapel. Mandy's from Mel Mel Mobile, Alabama. He's an author. He's a musician, part of a heavy metal screamo band called For Today. And a preacher. Travels around the country and around the world, even as he's heading off to Australia in a few weeks to preach. Let's welcome Mandy Montgomery. Hello, Spring Arbor University. How are you this morning? Good, good, good. Um, I read somewhere that chapel is one of the one of the the most exciting times of the week. Most of one of the most exciting times of of student life at Spring Arbor University. Is that true? All right. Well, I'll see. I'll see what I can do to fix that. Just, <laughs> just kidding. Um, listen, it's an honor to be back. Uh, I'm, I'm really glad uh, to be here, and I, and I want you to know, and I say this from the bottom of my heart, I really believe in you. And I know that that's something that we, you know, maybe, maybe throw around or maybe um, people have said that to you in the past and, uh, you know, you didn't believe it for, for whatever reason or they didn't mean it for whatever reason. I want to tell you, um, I've been praying for this group, and I've been uh, uh, seeing uh, the potential of this moment, and, uh, and, and I believe uh, with all of my heart that, that out of this room, uh, out of this campus, uh, God intends to touch the corners of the earth. God intends to reach the unreached, to release the kingdom into places uh, that it has never touched before, uh, and, and, and uh, essentially to change the, the, the course of history for this generation. And listen, I know that right now it seems like a bunch of homework and tests, and I got to get up early and get into class, and you know, uh, like you're just running through the, the, the ring or trying to keep up. But I want you uh, to not lose sight of the vision. I want to make sure uh, if, if you leave here with anything, I want you to have a clearer picture of the vision uh, of God for you as an individual and for you as, as a, a, a body because I believe that God dreams about changing the course of human history through this group. Do you guys believe that? Good, man. You know, something I, I was thinking about just the other day is uh, – if you go into work in the morning and, and you are not convinced that something might happen that day that could change the world forever, then you either need to find another line of work or you need to, ch- you need to get a, a, a heart check. Now, even if, I mean, I'm talking about even if you, you are flipping burgers at McDonald's, if you play in a metal band, huh? if you pastor a church or, or, or you're a janitor somewhere, 
Uh, I think that that uh, when you wake up in the morning, you need to be so convinced of God's ability to turn someone or something that is completely insignificant into something that could potentially uh, change everything forever. Uh, I believe that God is able to do it. I believe that God uses the weak things to confound the, the strong and the foolish things to confound the wise. I don't think there's anybody here that's that, that, that is completely qualified for ministry, but Jesus is. So we're just going to do our best to point people to him, right? All right. <clears throat> okay, I got, I'm going to just get right into it. Um, uh, today, I, I really believe um, that God is going to help to equip some of you for the ministry, to be able to see uh, people the way that God sees them. And, and ultimately, and I'm going to get into this a little bit later and kind of expound upon it, but ultimately, uh, the, the, the foundation on which ministry is built is seeing people the way that God sees them, seeing them uh, through his lens of compassion, seeing them uh, 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 rightly, seeing them as, as people that, that, that could potentially bear the image of the uncreated God, but, but people that maybe right now that image is, is warped, it's obscure because of their rebellion and their sin, that they've, they've been uh, put at, at enmity with God, but he's given us a ministry of reconciliation, not imputing the world's righteousness or uh, uh, the world's trespasses against them. So uh, what, um, uh, what I, I, I hope to equip you to do today is to see people the way that God sees them, both the people uh, sitting next to you here on this campus and, and also uh, people that are, that are unsaved, people that are lost. And I want to help uh, show you in Scripture what exactly God uh, has, has put in them and what exactly uh, you can do to help to, um, to help to rightly identify them and invite them to become who it is God intended for them to become. Because ultimately that's ministry, Right. Uh, listen, uh, I believe that it is only a community of kingdom-minded people that can receive this word. I think many have the capacity to intellectually understand the truths I'm about to share, but only a few have the spiritual sensitivity needed to be able to really apply them. But I think you're up for the challenge. I want you to, 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 to understand that, that simply intellectually understanding kingdom principle is not the same as applying it. It's not the same as being a, a kingdom person. That is not uh, what was referred to as the renewing of your mind. That's not the thing that has the power to transform a person's life or to equip or qualify a person for ministry. Uh, having, having gotten AIDS on all your tests through Bible college, you can still go to hell. Huh? You can still be a terrible representation of the character of Jesus Christ because it's not, uh, it's not nearly as much about what you know as it is about who you know. Or to say it another way, it's not nearly as, as much uh, about what you know as it is how you know it. If you learn about God because you are deeply passionate about him and his word, you'll learn the exact same stuff as if you learn about God because, you, uh, because your parents made you go to Bible college. And one is glorious and is eternally significant, and one is a waste of your time and your parents' money. All right. Listen, I won't go too far down that road. I don't want to yell at anybody. <clears throat> okay, so today I want to challenge you to see what the rest of the world is missing. Listen, I think that there, there are things uh, present in this world, that there is glory present in this world uh, that has been shrouded from the vision uh, of people that have not been born again or people that have not been born of the Spirit. And what I mean by that is this. Here, I, I, I'll uh, just throw this out there. In, in Isaiah chapter 6, the seraphim are recorded as, as flying around the throne uh, and, and declaring day and night, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And then they say something that's really weird. They say the whole earth is full of his glory. Well, that's an interesting thing for someone to be saying 800 years before the birth of Christ. Why would they say the whole earth is currently full to capacity of his glory? That seems, that seems really uh, counterintuitive. I mean, I've said for, from, from the platform, we know that the whole earth isn't full of God's glory, but someday it will be. And then I quote this verse and I say, we know that, that someday the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea until I went and checked myself uh, and found out that that verse actually says the, the whole earth, uh, the awareness of the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. And so the thing that is changing is not the amount of glory in the earth, but the amount of awareness of that glory. Now that is significant because that means that right now the whole earth is full of his glory. But most people are missing it, right? 
I mean, most Christians are missing. Most, most Christians are too busy to see the glory of God that is apparently, according to Scripture, swirling around us, that, that is, is apparently resting on the earth in full capacity right at this moment. We're too busy uh, doing our Christian stuff. We're too busy playing on Christian softball teams and having potlucks and, uh, and going to get coffee with other Christians to see the fact that the glory of the living God is filling the world in which we live. So I want to I challenge you today to begin to see a, a, a treasure that God has hidden in, in the earth. And I'll show you in just a minute that there is a treasure that God has hidden in men. And I believe that that is where ministry starts. That in, in terms of your ministry to other people, in, in terms of the way that we, we serve or relate to the people around us, that's where it begins. It's in the place of, of, of seeing that God has knit something into them that bears witness to his goodness, that, that God has, has, has built something inside of them inherently that, uh, uh, that, that, that God himself finds glorious. Now, I'll show this to you in Scripture here in just a minute. Uh, but, but like I said, today I want to challenge you to see what the rest of the world is missing. The Father has hidden unspeakable riches in every corner of creation, and I believe only those who have been born of the Spirit and who see by the Spirit will be able to unlock these treasures. Now, I believe that many of you are called to ministry. I won't go too far down this road. I'm not trying to mess with your uh, tuition income, but I believe many of you are not called to ministry and think you might be because you love Jesus. Listen, there's ev every Christian is called to ministry. Not every Christian is called to vocational ministry. You get the difference? And it's, there, listen, there's no shame in not having the word pastor before your name on your office door. I play in a metal band. There's nothing, no, nobody is excited about that. Like people, <laughs> I told Ron, he's like, what should I say about you? And I said, well, I play in a metal band. And he just looked at me like, I guess it's too late to ask him not to speak now. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, uh, listen, you don't have to impress people with your title. I don't know how many like random sketchy, like, uh, I don't know, all right, I don't want to hate on. I don't know how many random dudes have come up to me and handed me cards that say profit on them, and it's like, really, dude? Listen, I don't care what your title is. If you're prophesying, I'm listening, you know? Uh, but unless you hand me a, a business card that says profit, and then I'm like, I don't know if I believe what you say. Uh, <laughs> So uh, I think that, that everybody in this room in one way or another was called to ministry, but I think that there are a lot of people here that were not called to vocational ministry, and I want to challenge you uh, to see the difference, and I want to challenge you to whether or not you are in ministry. I think there are a lot of people here in this building that are waiting for a degree to begin burning for God. And can I tell you that, that a degree is not going to do it, man. Hanging that thing on your wall is not going to somehow ignite a fire of passion for God. You making up your mind to not live another day outside of his, the, the glorious awareness of his presence. That's what's going to do it for you. you do you want to know what happened in me to, to set me on fire for God and to change everything in my life? There was one moment in which everything changed, in which I could no longer go back, in which I could no longer look to the left or to the right, but all I could do was pursue the true and living God. This is what happened. I made up my mind to quit being lazy. This, an angel with a flaming sword didn't bust down my bedroom door and tell me that now is the time to step up and become the deliverer of God's people. Listen, I didn't have anything like that. I just said, man, I'm tired of seeing fake Christians, and if nobody else is going to do it for real, I'll do it. I made up my mind. And I tell you, man, I want to challenge you to make up your mind to be a part of what God is doing in the earth. I want to uh, challenge you today to make up your mind to decide today uh, to, to, to answer the call of God on your life and to, and to uh, partner with God in redeeming the people around you and redeeming the world uh, in which we live. Now, listen, I, I want you to see, and I'm going to show you in just a minute, that the foundation for effective ministry is being able to see those to whom you are called the way that God sees them. I'll say that again. The foundation for effective ministry is being able to see those to whom you are called in the way that, uh, that God sees them. Now, if, uh, because of the nature of my ministry, I do a lot of, of preaching in bars uh, in secular clubs and, and, and uh, nightclubs and music venues. Uh, now, because of that, if I were to walk into this place and see every girl that was dressed, uh, dressed like and acting like a whore as a whore, I would never expect anything uh, different from them. 
Therefore, I would never be able to apply faith to my ministry for them. And all that I'd be doing is putting on a show and writing these girls off as worthless trash. Now, if, if every drunk that stumbled up to me and said, bro, your music is awesome, man. I totally love your band. Let me get a picture, man. Let's take a picture, bro. Uh, if every time that happened, if I just shrugged my shoulders and was like, man, this guy's just a drunk. I need to get him away from me. If I saw these people the way that God saw them, uh, I'm sorry, if I saw this people the way, th- these people the way that the world saw them, I would never be able to effectively minister to them. But listen, if I see these girls that are giving their body away for the approval of men as, as, as princesses, as people that were made in the image of the living God, and I, tr- I begin to treat them uh, in accordance with that revelation, I think it might change something about them. All right, listen, I, I won't go too far down that road. I'm going to get there in, in, in just a little bit. But uh, to every person, drunk, drunk person, promiscuous person, fornicator, homosexual, uh, uh, drug addict, a suicidal, depressed kid. Listen, I don't care who it is, but to every person, there is, a, a, there is offered a measure of greatness that will, for most, go unrealized. Now, this is because they are only able to see what is, but not what could become. And what I mean is they, they, they are only able to see what is about them, and that is... Uh, uh, I'm sorry, they're only able to see what is about the, the, the greatness that God has offered to them, and that is that it would be a responsibility and not what it could become, and that is an honor. Now, I think, I think that it's safe to say, and I'll show you in Scripture, that, uh, that, that the Father has uh, uh, invited and challenged every single uh, uh, person on the face of the earth to, um, to greatness, that he's put a treasure inside of them. He's put something valuable and precious inside of every single one of them, not because they earned it, not because they asked for it, not because they deserved it, but simply because he loved them and had a plan for their life. And when God put them together, he gave them talents, he gave them gifts, he gave them greatness, he gave them treasure uh, that, that only they possess. Now, that is an incredible thing for those of us who are saved, but for those of us who are not saved, who are not utilizing that gift, that's a terrible thing because that means that we have uh, now a response responsibility that we have not said yes to. How many of you understand that because God has given you a gift, you are now responsible to steward it appropriately? You get that? Now, uh, I want to show you that that, uh, in the lives of people that refuse to, to use the gift God has given them or the treasure God has given him, the motivator is fear. Now, those girls I was talking about that come into these bars wearing trashy clothes and, 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 and selling themselves for a few kind words, Those girls have something precious inside of them, something glorious inside of them. God has placed something unique and valuable inside of them. But the reason that they they, uh, uh, have hidden it, the reason that they've buried it, the reason that uh, that they're ignoring it is not because they don't know about it, but it's because they're afraid. And I'll show you this in Scripture. But it's because they're afraid. And and, and today, uh, the sermon that I'm preaching is called Buried Treasure. I figured that was a catchy enough phrase. Y'all might be able to remember it. Buried treasure. Okay. Uh, listen, uh, first, and, and I'm going to begin to show you some of these concepts in the Word. Uh, first, I'm going to go to Matthew chapter 25. I think you guys have it on the projector. Put your glasses on. It's tiny. <laughs> uh, then let's, all right, this is the, the parable of the talents. I'm assuming that y'all are relatively familiar with it. Just in case you aren't, uh, the story goes like this. There's a master that has three servants. He's about to go on a... Uh, a trip, and he calls these, these servants to himself, and he gives uh, to each of the servants, according to their own ability, he gives to one servant five talents, to another two, and to another one. And then he leaves and goes on a trip. And while he's gone, uh, the, the servant that has five talents invests those talents, and, uh, and then when the master returns, he gives him ten in return and is rewarded greatly for it. The, ma- the, the servant that had two uh, talents goes and invests his two talents, and then when the master returns, uh, he Uh, He gives him four talents, and the master says, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will make you ruler over many. And then uh, this is where we pick up. The master returns and then comes to to see what the the, the servant that had been given one talent uh, had done with his one talent. And it says, uh, then he who had received one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. But the Lord answered and said to him, 
you wicked and lazy servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers, and at my coming I would have received back my own with interest. Therefore, take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away and cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's a, 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 a hard story to swallow, right? I want to show you something. If, you, if y'all could leave this up here for just a minute. I want to show you something that I think a lot of people skip over uh, in, in, in uh, their interpretations or, or, or in reading this passage. It says uh, in verse 25, uh, I'm sorry, in verse 24, it says, Then he who had received one talent uh, came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. Okay, I want to uh, uh, help to elaborate on that for just one minute. He said, uh, I know that you expect to, to reap where you have not sown and gather where you have not scattered seed. He said, Master, I understand that you are a man that expects a large return on your small investment. He said, I, essentially he said, I understood the command. Everybody else knew that you were a man that, that reaps where you have not sown and gathers where you have not scattered seed. And they went, as a consequence, they went and invested the talents that were given to them and, uh, uh, and, and gave you more than you initially invested. Now, he says to the master, I knew that you were that kind of man. I knew that you were the kind of man that would expect a return on your investment in me, and I was afraid. Now, that, that is why, and, and, and there are a couple other reasons in the, in the story that I could show you, but that's not what I'm talking about today. But that is one of the reasons why uh, he received such a harsh judgment, because he, it wasn't that he didn't know the command. It wasn't that he didn't know what he'd been given or for what purpose he'd been given it. Uh, it was that he was afraid of the responsibility of the treasure the master had given him. I don't know if anybody in here yet sees themselves in this, but man, I know I spent years being afraid of the treasure the master had given me. I thought, listen, I don't want to be a leader. I don't want to, uh, I don't want to be responsible for other people. I can't handle that responsibility. I'm afraid of the responsibility, just like this man. And, and as a result, it's not that I didn't wind up leading people. It's that I wound up leading people to hell. It's that I wound up leading people to me, and I wound up leading people to my music, and I wound up leading people to you know, whatever I thought was cool, instead of taking real responsibility and becoming accountable for the, 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 the talents, the treasures, the investment that the master had given me. As a result, I wound up uh, burying my treasure. All right, so, so he says, and, and I'm going to camp out here for just a minute. Uh, it, he says, uh, I know you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid. Everybody say afraid. Fear is what motivates people to bury their treasure, not ignorance. Listen, I don't care how lost a person is. If you go up to them and you say, tell me something that is unique about you that you have to offer the world that maybe nobody else can or maybe few people can or maybe lots of people can, but it's something that you have to offer. And there's not a person on planet Earth that, that if they take an honest look at themselves couldn't give you a list of things. I'm pretty good at music. I can make people laugh. I'm really caring. I can bake pretty good cookies. Listen, I don't, know, I don't know what it is, man. I don't know what, what it is that the master has given you. I don't know what it is the master has given the people that, uh, to, that, that you're going to encounter. But I want you to understand that ignorance is not the reason that this man buried his treasure. Fear is. And in the people that you will encounter in the world, the people that you will encounter in ministry, the reason that they are burying their treasure is not ignorance. It's not that they don't understand what, uh, what the Father has given them or, or haven't seen what the Father has given them. It's that they're afraid of the responsibility of it. Now, I was going to spend more time on this, and I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but I want you to, to, to see that there are two groups of people that I see primarily that, uh, that will bury their treasures, and those are believers that are content with living in lack or in less than the Father has called them to, uh, and they are unbelievers. Now, unbelievers, I often speak to unbelievers that are bending over backwards, doing anything they can to deny the reality of God. But what I say to them is, well, if there is no God, If there is no God, then there is no uh, uh, moral obligation to seek or value truth. You can do and believe and be whatever you want, right? And they say, well, yeah. 
And then I say, well, you trying to tell me that you can't believe in God. Like, there's just not enough evidence. There's just not, you know, I just can't logically uh, get to the conclusion that there must be a creator or there must be a deity or there must be a God. Uh, uh, because there's, there's simply not uh, sufficient evidence for his existence. But if God doesn't exist, then there is no truth and you can believe whatever you want. Just choose to believe it. It's easy. Right? If, there, right? if there is no truth, if there is no standard for truth, then you just go ahead and believe whatever you want. And you could choose to believe that God existed. So uh, uh, really at the end of the day, atheist, you don't believe in God because you don't want to believe in God. And if you're willing to admit that, then we can like get past this and we can have a communication. But if you're trying to tell me that you can't believe in God, then you are standing on a moral uh, uh, precedent that cannot exist if there is no truth. You get what I mean? Is it true, right? There is no truth. Is that true? <laughs> That's really what it boils down to. So I want to tell you, and this is what I've said to many unbelievers, and they look at me like I'm crazy, and they get mad and, and stomp off in a huff. Uh, I say, ultimately, you're afraid of being accountable to God. And so as a result, you are running around doing everything you can to bend and twist logic and, and pulling obscure passages from, from obscure books to try to, to disprove the fact that God exists. Not because you really, really, really believe that he doesn't exist, but because you're afraid of having to answer to him one day. You know, the, the, the interesting thing to me is that every atheist in the world knows what a burning man or woman of God should look like, even though most Christians pretend like they don't. Huh? I've I've heard from more atheists that they've seen fake Christian. Atheist knows what a real an atheist knows what a real Christian looks like. All right, I'm not going to go too far. Okay, <clears throat> but then lacking believers, many uh, maybe I would even say most Christians in the Western Church settle for much less than what God has made available to them. This is not because they are ignorant to the promises of God, uh, or because they are in some way unequipped to receive them, but because they are afraid of what the fulfillment of those promises will demand of them. Now, I, and, and I, I would challenge you to look at yourself because I think this may be some of you. I think this may be many of you, that you are afraid of the responsibility that comes with answering the call of God in your life. If, if I become a part of a mighty move of God on this campus, then I'm responsible to keep that up. I'm responsible to continue leading worship. I'm responsible to continue this Bible study that I've been called to start. I'm responsible to continue going out and laying my hands on the sick and seeing them recover. I'm responsible to continue doing the work of the Lord. So if I just don't start, then I'll never be responsible for it. And, and uh, can I tell you, that is what this man did, and it didn't turn out good for him to say it, to put it mildly, right? So uh, uh, fear, like I said, fear makes people bury their God-given greatness to avoid being responsible for the way that they steward that greatness. In this parable of the talents, we can see that even though the wicked and lazy servant was aware of the master's expectations, he was afraid of the responsibility that had been given him, so he buried his treasure. Many people in the world are in that exact same situation, uh, and and. But there is a truth hidden in Scripture that I believe holds a key for digging up their buried treasure and finally revealing to creation what the Father has given them. Now listen, I, I'm going to go in just a, a minute to Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. There's another passage in Scripture about buried treasure. I think it's really interesting. Early this year, uh, we were on a tour called the, the, or I guess last summer, we were on a, uh, a tour called the Warp Tour. And uh, it's an outdoor tour um, in which... Uh, it's an outdoor all summer long tour. So it's like 120 degrees every day. Um, and there's just thousands and thousands of people. I don't know how many times I saw, you know, 16, 17 year old girls walking around in Lord knows what. And I couldn't, it's funny, uh, uh, I couldn't help. I'm like 25 years old and I couldn't help but look at these girls and say, Where is your dad? <laughs> I can't believe your parents let you walk out of the house like that. Put a shirt on, girl. Uh, and, and the father began to challenge me and say, I want you to see these people the way I see them. I want you to look at them and say, I know, listen, I know, I know that you're lost. I know that you're perverted. I know that you've been totally corrupted uh, by the things of this world and by the, the schemes and the deception of the enemy. But there's still something incredible in you. And he showed me this passage, uh, this other uh, passage regarding buried treasure. It says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid. And for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Now listen, going back to the passage that we just read, uh, can anybody tell me why there was a treasure buried in a field? Because the person to whom the treasure had been given was afraid. Huh? So I had always 
been taught uh, uh, growing up that this passage was about, man, I found the kingdom. It was hidden, and I couldn't see it, so I gave everything that I had uh, to, to get it. But uh, recently, the Lord really challenged me on something. Recently, the Lord began to shift my, the, my view of, of this passage, and he said, he showed me that, that consistently in Scripture, a field is always representative of people. That's why we, we know the verse, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send uh, laborers. And, and John writes, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are white for the harvest, right? We're, we're familiar with these verses. So, so the field is representative of people, and, uh, and, and we know that, that someone would bury a treasure because they are afraid. Uh, and, and a man uncovered that treasure because he was able to see in the field a, a treasure that no one else saw. All right, we're almost there. Somebody can see the finish line. Listen, uh, he was able to see in the field. He was able to see in the people a treasure that no one else saw. And I want to tell you, I believe that this verse is the gospel. Let me, listen, let me really mess with your theology. In Luke chapter 17, I think you guys have these passages as well. Uh, in Luke chapter 17, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. It says, now when he was asked by the Pharisees when the, king, uh, when the kingdom of God would come, he answered, and said, uh, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, see here or see there. For indeed, this is really weird to say to the Pharisees, the kingdom of God is within you. If there is anybody in the world that is not saved, it's the Pharisees. We all know that. They are the perfect example of what not to be. But Jesus still looks at them and says, the kingdom of God is inside of you. So these, listen, these girls that I was interacting with this summer, these lost people, these drunks, these drug addicts, these people that are completely and utterly devastated by the deception of the enemy and by the corruption of the world in which we live, I can look at them, man. God has given me a grace, and I believe that God intends to give you a grace to be able to look at people like that and say, listen, I know that you're lost. I know that you're broken. I know that you're hopeless. I know that you are desperate, but I see the kingdom of Almighty God inside of you. I see a treasure that nobody else sees. Let's notice, hallelujah, let's go back to uh, Matthew 13. Notice that the man walking in the field didn't just buy the treasure. He didn't just pick the treasure up and try to sneak off with it without the owner of the field noticing. He gave all he had, and he bought the whole field. Hallelujah. He bought the whole field with all of its dirt. He bought the whole field being well aware of the fact that he was going to have to go through the, 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 uh, the hardship of excavating the treasure. He knew that, that the treasure was dirty and it was hidden and it was covered by a bunch of garbage. But he said, listen, I'll pay the price for all of it. He said, I don't care. I know that it's dirty, but there's something beautiful in that field. I know that it's going to be hard, but there's something beautiful in that field. I know it's, going to be, uh, uh, it's not going to be glamorous or dignified or noble, but there's something beautiful in that field and I need to have it. So I'll give it all. I'll pay the price to have it all. Friend, can I tell you, that ability, that supernatural ability to see something beautiful inside that field, to see something glorious, to see something uh, uh, valuable to Jesus inside that field of broken people, inside that field that's been uh, of people who've been deceived and misled by the schemes of the enemy that have bought into the lie of this world. That is what ministry looks like. Now listen, I want to break it down for you. There is a price that has been paid that is enough for every life and every heart. He bought the whole field. He paid the price for the whole field. He was only interested in the treasure, but he paid the price for the whole field. Jesus said, I'll take you with your porn addiction. Jesus said, I'll take you with your suicidal thoughts. I'll take you in your fornication. I'll pay the price for you and your fear and your insecurity and your doubt and your unbelief. I'll take you. Now, how dare we say to the world that they're not welcome? How dare we say to the world that they got to change before they come to Jesus? Friend, I want to tell you that that treasure didn't get revealed until, the, uh, until this man bought the whole field. Tell them, listen, I, I, I want people to see through your life that whether or not they get it together, whether or not they, they have everything figured out, there is something valuable inside of them. Would you stand up in this place? I want to I wanna just pray over you right now as I'm, as I'm closing. Listen, Romans 8 says all creation is groaning in anticipation for the sons of God to be revealed. I want you to understand that for something to be revealed, it must first be hidden. And I believe that there is something valuable, something incredible, something beautiful inside of you and inside of every lost person you'll ever encounter that, that Jesus paid it all to have. And that is what ministry looks like. 
to say, I know that you're dirty, and I know that it's going to be a, 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 a labor. I know that it's going to be difficult. It's going to be uh, undignified and dishonoring to me. But I'll give it all to have this field. You stay with me today, Spring Arbor. All right, listen, I just want to pray over you right now. Father, I just ask right now that you would open the eyes of the people in this room to begin to see the loss the way that you see them, to begin to see a treasure hidden in a field. Hallelujah. God, I ask right now that you would sharpen their spiritual sensitivity to be able to see what it is that you've placed in them. God, and right now in the name of Jesus, I challenge them to take your, your torch of redemption, God, to, 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 to take up this ministry of reconciliation to bring people that have been lost, that have buried their treasure and to proclaim to them that the price has been paid for their field, dirt and all. And that only Jesus can bring the treasure out of it. Hallelujah. Lord, I pray that they would, would, would release courage to the lost, to the people that have been afraid, that have been so afraid that they buried the greatness God put in them. And, and, and that that courage would, would inspire these people to release what it is that you've put in them, God, for your glory, for your fame in the earth, and for your honor. God, we give you praise this morning in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for the task that you've laid before us, and we say yes to it. Spring Arbor, I want to hear you say yes. Hallelujah. Glory to the living God. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate your time. God bless you.